Hi guys, Pastor Matt Chandler here. Pray uh, that this sermon, this resource, uh, be used by God in conjunction with you belonging to a local church uh, to grow you and sanctify you in your faith. If these resources bless you, would you consider giving back to us here at TBC? You can do that either through the app or you can go online to TBC Resources uh, and give there. Again, pray that this blesses you and grows you in your love for Jesus Christ. God called Abraham out of the chaos of the ancient world to make through him a chosen people to bless all nations. Then God delivered his people from Egypt, but they refused to enter into the land set aside for them and wandered in the desert. God gave them the law to consecrate them as his people, and eventually they entered the promised land, but they forgot his law and worshiped other gods. God called judges and prophets to warn and encourage them. He established David as king and there was peace and prosperity, but they forgot him again and the kingdom fell. So God sent Nehemiah to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. He sent Ezra to remind them of his law and the temple was rebuilt. Yet again, they turned from God and embraced the world around them. But God, longing for their whole hearts, called forth his prophet Malachi to remind them of his faithful love and of the kingdom that was coming. Good morning, I'm Nina Klingman. I've been at the village for 12 years. Um, my husband and I, Greg, serve as premarital mentors to the family ministry, and I also serve on the connections team as an usher. Um, today, I'm going to be reading from the book of Malachi, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. The oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste his hill country and left his heritage to jackals of the desert. If Edom says, we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins, the Lord of hosts says, they may build, but I will tear down, and they will be called the wicked country and the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. Your own eyes shall see this, and you shall say, great is the Lord beyond the border of Israel." This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hey, hey guys. It's good to see you. It's been a bit. Uh, always good uh, to be back. Before we dive into this passage, which I'm assuming is some of your favorite passage, um, I, I wanted to just highlight, we always want to celebrate good, right things. Uh, he's not in this service. He was in the last service. But Danny Spencer, uh, who's been a member of this church for 20 years, uh, celebrated on Friday night uh, 24 years sober. Uh, and so when Danny first came to this church, uh, close to... I mean, honestly, right, not long after that, uh, not long after his life completely uh, fell apart, um, a divorce, or just a, everything, if you think about the ravages of addiction, um, like Danny limped in here, whole world in ashes, uh, and for 20 years he has served faithfully as a picture of the victory of Jesus over the brokenness of human hearts and sin and death. So if you know Danny, and I know a lot of you do, when you see him, congratulate him. Uh, we're one more year away from that 25th anniversary. Uh, we'll, we'll blow that thing out when it gets here. So uh, if, you, if you see Danny and, and, and you know him, uh, tell him congratulations, because that's a huge deal. It's a huge deal. If you've been around addiction, it's a huge deal to get out. Uh, and, and then to have things all get put back together is a rare, beautiful grace of God. So I just wanted to highlight it. Um, a couple of uh, months ago, in fact, it wasn't even a couple of months ago, it was about a month ago, uh, a good friend of mine, one of my closest friends, actually even a, a family member by marriage, he came to my house. It was just evident uh, that he was in the middle of a kind of renewal in his relationship with the Lord. It's, uh, uh, what I mean by that is in a season where um, he, he has known the love of God, he, he has uh, faithfully followed Jesus for a long time, and yet he was in this season uh, where it was like that, that switch had been turned up, and so uh, like the Bible was coming easy to him, and, and prayer was coming, he felt the nearness of Jesus, and he, he was sharing this with me over, we were about to have 
dinner and he was like, he, here's what he said. He was like, I was reading the Psalms and I mean, just every, every morning I'd read the Psalms. I'd find my heart just like captivated by the beauty of Jesus. And then I got into the Proverbs and there was such wisdom there. And then I got to Isaiah and I was like, what? And then I got to Jeremiah and I was like, huh? And then I got into the minor prophets and it, it was like I was seeing God having a bad day. I, I was see, seeing like God at his worst. And I was, and it really, it was, he was saying it was kind of affected him that he was like in the Psalms. He was like, yeah, great and worthy are you. And then he got uh, to Isaiah and Jeremiah where God's like, I'm going to burn the thing to the ground. I'm killing all of you. And he's like, whoa. And it kind of took him back. And, um, and, and so even like you might be thinking, why in the world are, are we going through Malachi? Like, why would you do this? Like, with all that's going on in the world, why, uh, why a minor prophet? Aren't those guys a bit upset? Aren't those guys a bit frustrated? Like, even in the five verses you've read, Pastor, I'm not interested, all right? I don't even know what denim of jackals he's burning to the ground, but this is the stuff I'm trying to get away from, and I'm trying to nestle in to warm, friendly, cuddle me up, Jesus, not the one that burns territories to the ground forever. Now, I think the reason those books don't land the way they are, uh, it is somehow along the way we have forgotten, we either have forgotten or haven't been taught that the 66 books of the Bible are telling a singular story, not 66 different stories, right? So, so if you, you, you wanna, so, cause we're a proof texting generation. Proof texting means I'm gonna take this verse out of its context and I'm gonna make it say what I want it to say. So give me Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you. Give me that one. I'll throw that on a coffee cup. Now, you don't want to go two chapters to the right or two chapters to the left, but give you that one verse. Uh, How about Philippians 4.13? Anyone? I can do all things through Jesus Christ who gives me strength. Put that on a t-shirt with like football player or it's just nonsense. He's actually talking about I've been rich and I've been poor and I can do all things. I can hang in there, come what may, right? But we're proof texty, and then we have a tendency to really like bumper sticker theology, right? Like quip, little quips. And so what ends up happening is a book like Malachi, or, or there are certain passages in Scripture that, that if we just look at them by themselves outside of, their, outside of their context can be extremely confusing for us. But the Bible tells one story, and it keeps referencing back to itself repeatedly. In fact, let me show you the cross-references in the Bible. Look at that. Isn't that unbelievable? That's the Bible reminding you, oh, back here is up here. And what I'm saying has to do with that. And what I'm talking about is back there. And if you don't know that, it's like, um, think about a a Netflix um, kind of show that has 12 episodes. And you watch 10 seconds of one episode and come back thinking you're an expert on the show. Well, you're not. In in fact, you're actually really dangerous when it comes to the show. Because you're going to talk like you know what you're talking about. And you'll have no idea what you're talking about. And so to see the Bible as a story, a book, with these 66 books forming a singular story helps us look at the minor prophets, helps us look at Malachi here and get a bit of an understanding uh, of what he's actually saying. In fact, the whole bumper that played right before I walked out here is, is an attempt to catch you up into the story. This is so far the, the story of God interacting with his people. That, that Next week when you're here, you could listen to that again, and I'm just catching you up into the story. But let me tell you why Malachi and why now. Uh, I think Malachi lays beautifully upon our current moment. Let, let, me, let me explain the context to which it is written. Um, the, the people of God are back in the promised land. They rebelled against him. They got sent away into exile. And, and Malachi partners with uh, Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, Those three books kind of form a triad that help us get a really beautiful picture of this train wreck of a moment in the history of the people of God. They've come back to the promised land. They've rebuilt the temple. And and then even though they've been brought out of slavery yet again, they're real quick to forget the God that saved them. And here's what's happening culturally at the moment. There's massive religious skepticism and personal disappointments are running rampant. Does that lay pretty well on where we are? Okay, Um, there's a moral deterioration and a religious apathy everywhere you looked. See a little bit of that? How about this one? Their are institutions, both government and the priests, so I would call that the church, were inept, they were corrupt, or they were both. Their government and their church 
was either inept or corrupt or both. If that doesn't lay right on top of us in 2023, I... I don't know what is, and maybe you're still believing your party's gonna rescue us, but both of them are for themselves, neither of them are for us, and it's inept, and it's corrupt, and it's broken, but more on that next fall. Now, let's keep going. <laughs> there were significant financial issues. There was a severe poverty due to high taxes and inflation caused by the Persian economic policies and a famine, and it resulted in the confiscation of property and debt slavery on a large scale. I'm getting that straight from Nehemiah chapter five. It's a mess. And God sends Malachi to herald one thing, return to the Lord, return to the Lord. And and the way that we're going to say, I'm just outline the book for you right now. The, The way he commands them to return to the Lord is by renewing their commitment to his instruction, especially the restoration of genuine worship. God is not interested in our leftovers. He does not desire to be our number one priority. He desires to be the piece of paper that our priorities are written on. And God says, return to giving worship to me to whom it's due. And then he, and this will be a tough week where we're gonna be fine. He calls them to loyalty into their covenant, specifically the covenant of marriage. He's got some pretty aggressive things to say about marriage in this passage, and we're gonna be all right. Okay, not in our passage today, in a couple of weeks. And then finally, he's gonna press into their faithful handling of their material possessions. That, that's, that's kind of, I just outlined the book of Malachi for you. That, that's where we're going. But it starts in a certain kind of way. It starts the way God always starts, and it starts the way none of us can really get in our guts that it actually starts there. All right, so let's look at this passage again. It's pretty wild how it begins. Let's just look at it. The oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. So this is from the Lord. The Lord wants to speak to his people, and he's going to use Malachi to do it. So what's the message to this people, this people that's a train wreck, to these people that are apathetic, to these people that are relationally fractured, to these people that have turned their back on God, that doubt his goodness, that are skeptical of his kindness? What's his message? Look at it. I have loved you, says the Lord. This is, in the Hebrew, it is a present, perfect, continuous, ongoing action. And the book begins the way God always begins, with an indicative. You know what I mean by indicative? You know that word, right? Yeah, indicative means just a statement of fact. Like God hadn't shown up and gone, here's what you need to do to get yourself out of this mess. God doesn't show up and go, here's what you're going to need to do for me to work on your behalf. He he just starts with, I have always loved you. I love you still, and I'll love you forever. Continuous, present, ongoing action. I have loved you. God always begins in the indicative. He never asks of you before he lays his love on top of you. You tracking with me? So let's look at it. This is 1 John 4, 18 and 19. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because what? He first loved us. And then I love Paul's explanation of this because it lays it right on the gritty, broken nastiness that is our lives. Romans 5, verse 8, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, not our behavioral modification, not our used to and now I don't, not our I've straightened up my act, not our I go to church now, not our I don't talk like that, live like that, walk like that. You've been justified by his blood, that the death of Christ absorbing God's wrath says that you are justified, made right before a holy God by an act of God, not your own act. And he keeps going. Much more, much more than that? Are you kidding me? Much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? God started this thing. 
You are, if you are, you know what's something that always blows my mind? Why did I listen to Jeff Faircloth? Jeff Faircloth's the guy that shared the gospel with me in high school. It's how I became a Christian. He was talking to 10 other dudes about Jesus. Why, why was I curious? Why did it provoke my heart? I mean, I had seen some nasty, I, I wasn't interested in Jesus. I had all sorts of issues with Jesus because some family dynamic stuff. And yet Jeff's talking about Jesus and I'm drawn to it in a way I didn't even realize I was drawn to it. So I'm reading the books. Like, why did I read the books? Not everybody was reading those books. Why did I say yes to go to JAM, which stood for Jesus and me on Wednesday nights? Why did I have questions? Why was I wrestling with the Lord? My plan was to become a lawyer, make a ton of money, and maybe get a couple of hot wives. Well, what happened to me? Well, the Bible says that he who began the good work, that, that I, uh, all that's good and right in my life came not by my hands, but by the grace of God. That while I was at my worst, Christ died for me. And if that's the case, then all these years later, how much more is he committed to me? How much more will he keep me? How much more will he move towards me in love despite my weakness and despite the fact that I am a slow learner? Anybody else a slow learner? Anybody else think they'd be a little bit farther along by now? Anybody else fight that kind of incessant thought that God's just like so disappointed now that he can see us face to face? Like 2,000 years ago, we looked like a really good idea, but now like this, this, is what I, this guy, this is what I died for. Anybody? I'm telling you, that's a, that, is a, that will be a fight in my heart until he calls me home. You loved me? You moved towards me? It always begins, always, with the indicative. Now, you see this all over the Bible. It, it, again, I'm not assuming all of you have been to church or all of you know a lot about church, but uh, one of the big movements in the story of God's people is the book of Exodus, where God saves his people from slavery in Egypt. Quick question. Did he show up in Egypt and go, here's the law, and once you do this, I'll get you out of here? You want to hear something crazy about the Exodus? Not at all. In fact, they're completely delivered from their oppressors before they get a single command. How crazy is that? Like, gets them out of it, destroys all the Egyptian gods. I mean, just works them over. If you never knew what all of those plagues were about, each one of those plagues corresponds to an Egyptian god. So God slaughters their god in public sight, leads them out into the wilderness, and then says, here's how life should be ordered. He doesn't say, here's how life should be ordered. Now, as soon as you do that, I'll get you out of the stump. No, he gives them freedom. And then the law. You ever thought about the thief on the cross? <laughs> I love that guy. He, he never gets to make any amends. He never gets to change the way he lives. He, he, never gets a, he, he just doesn't get to do any of that. Never develops any kind of theological grid or system. Never even, I mean, gets to repent in heart only. <laughs> and what does Jesus say to him? Today you will be with me in paradise. Malachi begins with, I have loved you. Present, continuous, ongoing, I have loved you. And then, man, here's, here's what happens next. Look, look at this. Next, the, what you'll see in Malachi, if you want to go read it this week, it's a short book, four chapters. You, you can look that there's this rhythm that starts where God says something like this, like I have loved you, and then they respond with, well, and, and the way Malachi does that is he says, but you have said. So in our case today, I have loved you, but you have said, how have you loved us? Now, this is, like us, a whiny, spoiled group of children. They are a whiny, spoiled group. God has led them back to the promised land. He has saved them again from their foolishness. He has moved towards them in covenant love yet again. And here he's saying to them, hey, don't forget this. Reorient, return. I have loved you. And life has been so hard. And it's beaten them up so much. Their response is, how? How have you loved us? Look, can we, can we be honest? There are seasons where that's in our soul. Gosh, some of you are in it today. Like here I am talking about the love of God, the love of God. And you're just so in it, man. You are so in it that you're just like, how? Reconcile this to me, pastor. How can my life be on fire like this? 
my heart be broken like this? My relationships be a mess like this? And you say that God says to me, I have loved you. Okay, well, God is never afraid of hard questions. Here's how he answers. But you say, how have you loved us? Here's his answer. Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste his hill country and left his heritage to jackals in the desert. If Edom says, this is crazy, if Edom says, oh, we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins, the Lord of hosts says, they may build it, but I will tear it down and they will be called the wicked country and the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. Okay, so this is one of those passages where you're just like, you, you loved us by burning a city to the ground and swearing that if they ever build it again, you'd burn it to the ground again? I mean, that's not, I mean, I don't, I don't know what your relationship is like with your significant other. That's not a gift I want from my loved ones. I'm going to destroy these people. But what, what's happening here in the passage? Let me, let me answer the question. How have you loved us? With patience, mercy, and grace. Malachi here is pointing back to a historical event in the Old Testament. Uh, the father of the fathers of our faith, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You will often read in the Old Testament, God described as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's one of the ways they said his name as they tried not to say Yahweh for honor and reverence of his holiness. So he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's the fathers. Well, um, he's pointing to this moment where um, Isaac's wife, Rebecca, is pregnant with twins. And in the womb, those boys hated each other. In the womb, they fought. The Bible tells us, I mean, if you've been praying, like in the womb, they, they fought each other in the womb. And, and then what happens is when they're born, Esau is the firstborn. So Esau comes up first with Isaac, or not with Isaac, um, with, let me look at my notes. I'm, I'm fresh, I'm back. I, I've got to. Right, he, he holds on. Uh, Jacob's holding on to Esau's heel when they come up. So this is what that means. Esau's the firstborn. He's the inheritance of the promise. The world will be blessed through the line. The Messiah is coming through Esau's lineage, except Esau was a godless man who wasn't interested in the things of God and was driven by his stomach. He was a wicked man who wanted nothing to do with the promise. And look at me, and Jacob's not any better. It's not like Esau was terrible and, and Jacob was awesome. They're both scoundrels. They're both uh, bad men. Neither could get hired on its staff. And if they did, they'd get fired quick. And you wouldn't hire either of them. And if you did, you'd fire them quick. They're scoundrels. They're liars. They're wicked men. And God says, through the line of Jacob, the promise goes. Not because Jacob was awesome but because God deemed it to be true. Because all that we have and all that we are are by the strength and might of God, not our own hands. And this is why the people of God should never walk with a swagger or a puffy chest. Or like, seriously, what'd you do? Like, what, seriously, what'd you do? You heard the gospel and you were given by the Holy Spirit eyes to see and ears to hear. Like, he who began the good work in this will be faithful to complete it. Not you who began the good work will be faithful to complete it. Like he started this and, and this is what he's pointing to right now. He's pointing back to the fact that the lineage of Esau becomes the Edomites and everywhere you read about them in history, they are treacherous, they are violent, they are wicked, they are proud, they are greedy, they are a violent people. And here's God's argument for his love for his people. He's like, Look up your eyes, lift them up your head. Like you're still here. I love you, I have moved towards you. You are guilty of the same thing and I have not abandoned you. You are guilty of the same treachery as everyone else and I have moved towards you in grace and healing and forgiveness. I have not destroyed you like I have destroyed others. And he's highlighting love and justice. And again, this brings us to a weird moment in history where the only thing most of us are going to let Jesus be is a feathered haired tinker barrel that just sprinkles fairy dust on everybody and he's never bothered by anyone. What an evil thing to think about the God of the Bible, that he would never care about evil or wickedness, that he would have no opinion about brokenness, that he would never have a aggression towards those 
who harm and belittle and destroy his creation. Jesus is not a butler. He's not a genie in a lamp. He is holy. He is fierce. He is mighty. And he moves towards his people in covenant love. He moves towards his people in covenant love. Again, I, I know all of this is kind of hard for us, but he's saying here, hey, Edom is going to become a territory of wickedness. There's going to be pictures of wickedness for you to see. There are going to be people that I give over to what they want, right? This isn't God, like this is giving people what they want. Like when people say, I don't want you, God. I don't want your ways. I don't want to submit. I'm going to do my own thing. God's wrath is oftentimes in that moment, not hurricanes or diseases. It's just like letting them do it. Okay, let me read it to you. This is Romans 1, 28 through 31. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them over to a debased mind to do what ought not be done. Okay, let's look at me. Everything you have and all that you are was given to you by God for God. By God for the glory of God. So, um, yeah, and I know, I know that's hard for us because I know you're like, well, I actually worked really hard. And I'm like, yeah, praise God that you're a hard worker. Do you know there was other people that worked hard like that and didn't get what you got? Right? You successful in the business world. There were some things outside of your control that were like you, you sit where you sit by the grace of God for the glory of God. You got a little paper, a little cheddar, got some money in the account given to you by God for the glory of God. Oh, I work hard. Yeah, there's a lot of people that work a lot harder than you that don't make a quarter of what you make. Right? You want me to keep going? You got a great marriage? Here, here's a little secret about marriage. Nobody knows who, there's mar who they're marrying when they get married. <laughs> Nobody. Y'all could date for five years. You don't know that woman. You don't know that man. You find out who they are on the honeymoon. And then you made that covenant... <laughs> So you're like, well, I guess I signed up. And then you start to get to know the person again. My wife's been like 19 different women, and I first met the first one on our honeymoon. We had hung out before. We had had some conversations before. But when the ring came on, I was like, okay, who are you? And she was like, now, now what, is, what is this? I'm not sure I signed up for this. And then, man, then you start, right? Then you start, right? You got a good marriage right now? You, you, get, you got like you're growing together. Love one another deeply, been through it and still in there. And that, look at me. That ain't because you're awesome and you know how to do it. That's the grace of God on your life. It's the grace of God. Like to fail to acknowledge him leads to a debased mind. So what ends up happening is you take everything that's good in your life and you heap it on yourself. Like you're, you're the reason that everything that's going right is going right. And then what will happen is when it blows up, because it always does, who are you going to blame? We're going to blame God. Can't blame you. You're flipping awesome. You're the reason that everything good has ever happened to you. You've earned it. You've worked it. You've pulled yourself up by your bootstraps. Life is great because of you. But let marriage get hard. Let a kid get sick. Let the bank run dry. Where were you? Where are you? Ding, 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 ding. Jesus, get in here and give me what I want. It's evil. It's wicked. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not be done. I want to point this out about the brokenness of the world. The brokenness of the world does not begin by God allowing things. The brokenness of the world begins when humankind, caught up in their own zeal to be God, chooses to turn their back on God and do things their own way. And that leads to this phrase, debased mind, to do what is not proper. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil covetousness, malice. They are full of envy and murder and strife and deceit and maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, which it just feels like that should have been earlier in the list. Like, do you put that one after inventors of evil? Apparently. Disobedient to parents, they're foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice such things. If that's not 2023 on all our feeds, I don't know what is. But I would also say to make sure you're reading yourself into that. 
This ain't no y'all and, and us. That this is a critique and a rebuke of the people of God. I said back when we were doing the formed series that, that the way formation occurs, the way we become more and more like Jesus is sin enters the cosmos and it fractures and we begin this process of dehumanization. Uh, every time we kind of turn our back on the way God has designed and the love that he's called us into, we begin to be more and more unhuman. We become dehumanized. We live in such ways and practice things that actually cause a lot of chaos and hurt and pain and death and sorrow and sadness and when we surrender to the love of Christ made available to us in the gospel, we begin the long process of what I'm just calling a progressive rehumanization. We become more and more and more what we were meant to be. And that's, that's the argument here that Paul is making in Romans. He's going, look, when we say, I don't care what you think about money or marriage or sexuality. I don't care what you think about uh, why. I don't care what you think about this or that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do me. I'm going to be me that we're choosing to enter this process of a debased mind that takes us farther into darkness and brokenness than we could ever fathom. And we'll wake up one day and go, oh my God, what have I done? But he doesn't start there. He starts here. I have loved you. Loved who? Well, according to Romans 5, all us debased morons. Who'd he love? That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So the heralding of the prophet Malachi to the people of God is simple. Return to the Lord. So how do you return to the Lord? I'm glad you asked. Uh, just two things. And at this point, I'm really proud of myself on time. Probably starting to talk like this isn't a good sign, but let me just get back to my notes. So how do you return to the Lord, or, or maybe for the first time this morning, to come to the Lord? Um, I, I think a part of that has to be to believe by faith and to ask by the grace of God to experience the love of God anew. In my own journey here, the shame of things I've been a part of and participated in, and then, you know what's actually my, my biggest enemy uh, when it comes to just resting in the Lord? Uh, I, the, the love of God, I have just like an insatiable achiever in me. Anybody else? Like, I've just got this insatiable guy that wants to do and get done and accomplish and, and show God, see how great I am? Look at all I've done, God. Look at this. Look at me. how amazing that is. Look at all I've done for you. Like I say this because I'm saying it to myself. It's easier for me to believe that I'm useful than I'm loved. Maybe, maybe, you're not, maybe you're not an achiever at all. Maybe you're on the other side of the spectrum and you, you're just like, you're a couch dude. You'd love that couch be calling you. Yeah, it's the same thing. Both of us are struggling with the same thing. He can't love me like this. Let me make myself lovable. It's an endless, soul-crushing, life-sucking orientation. And the Bible nowhere starts there. It always starts here. I have loved you. Me? I have loved you. You, you know about me? I know about you more than you know about you. And I have loved you. It's this weird conversation with the Lord. Well, he'll let you know you're far worse than you think you are and you're far more loved than you can fathom. That's profound in that moment where you just think, I've got these little things I need to work on and the Lord's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But under those things, some pretty significant things. And I'm here for it, Matt. For the rest of your life, for as long as it takes, I'm here for it. To turn towards that love, regardless of how you walked into this room today, is how you return to the Lord. And some of you, it'd be the first time ever you've heard the gospel like this, that it begins with, I have loved you, to step in and I go, I want that love. I'm going to take that. Or, or maybe some of you, you're just in that season where this is real hard for you. It's like, God, I need to be reminded of that. I'm on fumes here. I'm not sure I'm going to make it out of this season because that's a thing too. And to cling to this, I have loved you anew, 
to have our soul reignited in his love is a powerful thing. I want to give you the opportunity to that. But then here's the second thing here. Um, and it's the thing that it's hard for us, and it's why sometimes in the next couple of six weeks, you're probably going to get frustrated with me, but I'm going to try to make it not me and just make it the book. Um, the God of the Bible is not some feathered hair fairy fluttering about, never being bothered by our sin and our rebellion. The God of the Bible is fierce. He returns with a sword coming out of his mouth and a tattoo on his thigh. Amen. And the Bible says the mountains run from him. The mountains. I was just up there. You know, unbelievable. Like you, get, like you go back country back there in the immensity. We, we, me and the elders, we, we were all out and we hiked up like 13.5. We like crested that Lung collapsing, muscle burning, last 2,000. Man, I came over the top and looked at the expanse and I just wept. So huge, so massive. Made me feel so small in the best way. And that's going to run from him. And for those of us who think sin is some sort of plaything that God's just going to look past, the Bible says of those people, they will find, try to find a mountain to hide under and it won't be there. So for some of us, some of us, it's moving towards that love because we've forgotten or we've never said yes. And, and others of us, it's just, just be reminded that God is holy. He's not your homeboy. He, he's not your buddy. Every time an angel shows up in the Bible, people fall on the ground like they're dead. And those are errand boys to the king. What's going to be like when he shows himself? The Bible says the sky will crack open. What? What does that mean? He's going to tear a hole in the universe and step into it? I love him. I know he loves me. It's going to be a pretty terrifying moment. Right? The, I, I'm, I mean, he, this better be true. <laughs> I mean, his grace and his love, right? That better, I banked my whole life on it. Right? And, and some of you, you've got ongoing sin that you tolerate because you think you're in control of it or it's no big deal. And that is rotting out your soul, which was meant for dynamic life and peace and power. And, and some of you have done such terrible damage to yourself. And, and again, let's go back to Romans 5 as I end. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Look at me and I'm going to finish. Jesus knew what he was buying on the cross. I've said this for 20 years. Jesus didn't die for that future version of you that you're trying to put together for him. You right now. Isn't that hard to believe? Uh, maybe not for you. It was terribly hard for me to believe. Terribly hard for me. I'm, like I said, I, let me get some more done for you and then maybe I'll feel like I finally earned it. But it's not, it doesn't start that way. It never starts that way. It always starts with, I love you committed to you. In fact, I'm so committed to you, I'm going to swear by my own name that I'm committed to you because there's nothing stronger for me to swear by. It's not like he can swear by you, right? I swear to you, Matt, that I'm going to, that's ridiculous. Like what? I'm weak and frail and stupid. And so he swears by his own name. I swear to me, Matt, I got you. Well, what about this? Yeah. Oh no, I knew that was coming a long time ago. We're going to get there. Gosh, you know, I've got stuff that's going to be revealed about my own heart, my own life 10 years from now. It's going to be like a bomb on me that's right now going on. I have no idea that it's there. Like, you know that about you too, right? I mean, you're like, you're like that poor soul. No, it's us. And who does he love? Who's he moving towards? That, us. And so here's my invitation to you today. In fact, why don't you do me a favor? Why don't you bow your heads, close your eyes. I want to... Um, want to close up our time together. Let me just say this. You're going to hear some noise as your heads are bowed and your eyes closed. If, you're, if you've got a kindergartner and you're in that kinder blessing, I want to go ahead and just dismiss you uh, to head down the hallway. It's such a cool thing that we do. I'm excited for you to get to bless your, your little kindergartner as they move into uh, elementary uh, ministry here. So why don't you guys head and do that? And let me just lay this before you as we close out our time together. I'm curious how many of you in the room would say, uh, man, I am in a season of my life where it's really difficult for me to believe 
that God sees all of me and loves me. I could maybe believe that he tolerates me. I could maybe believe uh, that he's patient with me. But if I'm real honest right now, it's hard for me to believe, either because of the struggle or because of the season or because of this hurt uh, or because of the sin pattern or because of things I've done. It's just hard for me to believe that he loves me. If that's your hand, would you raise your hand high like we're not Baptist? Good. We are, but just not enough to keep you from raising your hand high. Praise God. All right, why don't you put your hands now? I'm going to ask a harder question. Uh, how many of you would say in this room, no, I, I believe that, and somewhere along the line in believing that, I have become lazy about putting sin to death in my life, and I know that there are wicked things that I'm doing, saying, behaving, ways I'm hurting others and, and sinning against God, and I have not been serious about the holiness of God, and I have not treated those areas of my life with great violence. If that's you, would you raise your hand? Man, I've got some serious sin junk i got to kill today. Praise God. Oh my gosh, so many. Why don't we put our hands down? Okay, look at me. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pray for us, and as I pray, there are going to be a group of men and women that come up front. They're members of our prayer team, and here, look, let's look. You will not say anything to them that makes them gasp. You will not say anything to them that makes us say, oh no, you got to get out of here. You will not. You are in a community of broken, dumb people believing in the goodness of Jesus. So I'm just saying you should feel right at home with it. Just come on in. If you're looking for a perfect church, we're not it. I don't, I, maybe it's down the street. Maybe it's not. It, we're not it. You're going to find us to be annoying and, and uh, frustrating and so again I want to say so you, you might feel right at home just come be part of us with us and so I'm going to pray for us and then I just want to invite you up man I just want to if you want to just like just pray for me that I might experience the love of God or if you've never been you've never said yes to Jesus just come up and say I'm gonna, I want to give my heart and life to you. I want to surrender to that love we'll baptize you today man we got shorts and a t-shirt a towel for you we'll just get after it right and, and then if you need to repent Repentance is not a nasty word. Re repentance is an invitation to fuller life. Re repentance is turning your back on that thing that's rotting out your insides and letting you move towards the life that Christ has purchased for you by his blood. You have not out his grace. But let me say this and then I'm gonna pray. I, I was, this is my favorite thing of preaching. Like, you came here today. <laughs> you got up, you got dressed, tried to find your kid's shoe, and you got here. Like, why? Could it be that much of what I'm saying today is specifically for you? If this is true, and God always begins with, I have loved you. Could it be that the thing he wanted you to hear today, regardless of life circumstances, is that I have loved you? loved you and to make me work real hard to get rid of all your butts around that. So I'm going to pray, and while I pray, our prayer team is going to come up here and stand up front. When I say amen, I just want to invite you to come up and receive prayer. Come up and ask. I need, I need the love of God in my life. I need to repent. I'm going to say it's all here open for you. And if I haven't touched on anything that's going on in your life, you just want prayer, we're here for you. Because we have experienced his love, we want to extend that love to you. But I would ask you to not wrestle inside of yourself. I just think one of the best tactics of the enemy is to get you in your head going, should I, should I not, should I? It's a dumb question. Should you receive the love of Christ that transcends life circumstances, that transcends your sin and stupidity, that transcends the amount of times that you turn your back on him and choose to be your own God. Should you receive that thing or not? See, it's a weird game that the enemy wants to play. Well, you know, one time when I was seven, I was baptized. I was, Great, but where are you now? Is there fruit from that? Is there life in that? Let me pray for us. While I pray, men and women are going to be up front. And I'm not going to make it easy. We're not going to all stand up to hide you. We're not, because there's something that enacts and empowers faith when we step out publicly and boldly and say, I need him. And in this season, I need him in a real profound and powerful way. Father, I bless these men and women in the name of Jesus. That you love us. Thank you. It's crazy to me that you love us. You move towards us. And I, man, I know my own messiness. I, I know after all these years, I still get blown away. 
so many hands, and that means so much hurt. And I know you want to lift that and heal that and build your life into that. And so I pray courage now. It's going to take courage for some of these men and women to just pop up in front of everybody and walk up here and be prayed for. And so we ask for mercy, for courage, and your power. It's for your beautiful name I pray. Amen.